All right, man. So, uh, first off, you know, DJ J Torture, you know, let's talk a little bit about, about how you got started in the industry. Um, what made you start DJ? Really, my, my biggest influence to start DJing was <clears throat> I remember watching DJ Jazzy Jeff. I don't know if it was on TV or a video or what, but I remember watching him and I was thinking, man, I wanted to. You know, do that. I always loved music. You know, I wasn't much of a singer or nothing like that. So it was like, I always loved music and had a good ear for it. So I was like, you know, let me get into this. So I started around the age of, you know, what, 12, maybe 13, um, just doing like little backyard stuff for, you know, basically for family. And I kind of grew fond of it. So I always wanted to get a set of turntables. I, you know, I networked with a couple of DJs in the city and, uh, at the time, I couldn't afford turntables, so it's basically you kind of use what you got, you know what I'm saying? And so finally, I, I got I got a set of turntables, and I started messing around. I had no clue what I was doing. I couldn't mix two songs together. Didn't know what a BPM was. Didn't know nothing, you know. So I used to go to uh, I used to skate. I used to be a skater, so I would go to the skating rink on Sundays, and uh, DJ LP was DJing up there at the time, and and I would go up there and I would just watch him and try to figure out what he was doing. I would go home and try to try to learn how to do it. And and I couldn't figure out, like, man, how's he doing this? So one day I asked him, I said, can you show me that? He was like, can I show you that? Said, yeah, show me that. So he kind of took me under his wing a little bit and uh, he showed me a few things. And I wouldn't say he taught me anything because he, he denies that. He said he didn't teach me. I said he showed me and I mastered it. So, you know, that's kind of how that story goes with that end. But I would just started to learn. I started to progress with my craft. I learned how to how to mix two songs together. And I remember the first two songs I could mix together. The first two songs I could mix together was a Super Duck break beat, and it was Lil John. I don't give a fuck. That's what it was. And I would come home every day, and I would mix those songs back and forth, back and forth. And for a while, I couldn't figure out how I got them to mix. But I started to progress. I started playing around with other records, and uh, it just it grew into it. And I started discovering, you know, I had a craft and, and I started researching the craft. And my very first gig, I could tell you, we made 40 bucks. It was me and a friend of mine. We had no clue what we were doing. He had some speakers. I had some turntables. He had to do a party, you know, and it was fun. And they, then they started calling us for other stuff and doing other parties. So it started to grow. And then I, like I said, I realized that I had a little talent and I started taking you know, watching videos and uh, I remember watching all the old DMC battles and um, I used to, you know, do some battle things and scratch and flash records and stuff like that. So it was it, a lot of that was, you know, it just I loved music and the biggest high for a DJ is when you're DJing somewhere and you look out in the crowd and everybody's dancing, having a good time. Like there's no bigger high than that. You know, there's there's no bigger high. So, you know, it's just. The love, the love will keep you going if you truly love and appreciate the craft and understand where it came from. Because I came from the era of carrying records. You know, I went through the era of carrying records to the change where people start using CDs and CD players until now we know where it's Serato and, and with the, where the industry is with controllers and things like that. So it's it's evolved, but I wouldn't change it. You know, I, I struggled a lot, but you learn. That's how you learn from it. So. All right. Now... You know, you came up in Indianapolis, Indiana. That's not really known for big name artists. There's a few of them that done yeah. made it out of here. You know, in reference to actors, actresses, and things of that nature. Right. Um, but we're not a big city that that really gets out there on the entertainment scene. Right now, how would you describe the city and what your experiences over the last few years and uh, just learning what goes on here? Well, the city. The number one thing, the bad, the I wouldn't say bad, but the city has a lot of great talent. I mean, as far as DJs, as far as producers, as far as artists, singers, I've seen some of the best talent I've ever seen. You know, I, and, I, and I'll tell anybody when I go anywhere that Indianapolis has the best DJs. We can outmix anybody because a lot of these other places you go to, they don't mix. They're yelling over the music. And if we're to go in their town, we can take over because of the fact that we can adapt to where when they come here, they can't adapt because of the way that our style is. We have a special Midwest style. Um, as far as the artists and things like that, the the thing about it is 
a lot of great talent here. A lot. And I've worked with a lot of people and I've worked with a lot of great talent here, but everybody's so eager to blow, be the first one to blow instead of supporting somebody that already has a hot record and running with it and everybody benefit from it. Everybody's so eager to, to benefit for themselves. It makes it hard for the great talent that we have here to get out. You know, we, there's, there's some great producers here, probably some of the best I've heard that would outdo a lot of these cats are in the industry now. But, you know, I love my city, don't get me wrong, I love the music, but you know, I had to move to better, further my career because I felt like as long as I stayed here, I wasn't gonna go anywhere. As bad as I wanted to go somewhere in my city, it just wasn't happening for me, you know, just, and I think a lot of, a lot of artists, a lot of people feel like, feel the same way, but sometimes they can't get out. So where did you move actually? I actually moved to uh, Arizona. Um, I'm in a small town right now called uh, Sierra Vista. It's about an hour south of Tucson. Um, small town, completely different from here. You know, it went from a big city to a small town. And it, it's, I mean, it's great. At first it was kind of kind of rough, like I said, because you know you're in a small town, everybody knows everybody. But now that it's grown into, you know, the nightlife is, has grown so much and they recently did a, a news article on me because I was one of the people that helped grow the nightlife and make it what it is. And now I'm currently expanded out into Tucson and, and I'm trying to expand out into uh, Las Vegas and L.A. and San Diego. So it's 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 great for expanding, you know, it, and that's that's where I'm at right now as of, as of this moment. So. Okay, so being in the West Coast or, yeah, definitely you're definitely on the West Coast. What is it like in reference to? you know, the diversity of it, because, you know, being here in the city, you know, is, uh, you've been around a certain type of environment, certain type mm -hmm. of music, things of that nature, mm -hmm. and then you go out to Arizona, like, what are they listening to out there? It's a lot of West Coast, um, but a lot of people don't understand right now the West Coast is actually the ones that are running the club music. Um, a lot of the producers are coming from the West Coast, a lot of the artists that are being featured and, and are starting to blow are from the West Coast, and coming back here, and just kind of listening to how things work around here, it is different. I mean, I noticed a change when I got out there. The way the music is played is a little different, in which I brought the the Midwest style out there, which they loved that, you know. So it was it was different for them. But as far as the music is played, it's so diverse. I mean, Latin, reggae, um, dance, top forty, EDM, house, you know, West just strictly West Coast music, club music. I mean, you pretty much play a lot of different genres that you normally wouldn't play here in the Midwest, you know, and it's, it's very diverse and it's, I mean, all in all, it makes you a better DJ. It makes you grow your craft because you have to be able to adapt to that crowd in, in a split second before you lose them, you know? We were having a conversation and uh, you were saying something along the lines of getting away from urban music because urban music is dying to a certain extent. Yeah. What did you mean by that and kind of break it down for the people who okay. feel like, you know. Well, I love urban music for one. And it's not to, to down it, but it's dying. And the reason why it's dying is because we're so stuck in a box. We're so scared to expand but try to do anything different. And a lot of the urban music, people follow what they see or what they hear or what they think is going on. So the thing about it is they get caught in that trap of following instead of creating their own buzz or creating something new because this is what they hear. So this is what they want to do. So the urban music in a way is dying, you know, and I hate to say that cause I love the urban music and I've done all that I can to help support it. But a lot of it, the artists don't want to put in the work. If you don't put in the work, I mean, it's going to die. It's going to take all of us, the DJs, the artists, the producers, it's going to take everybody, getting back together and, and building that. And that's what the industry wants. The industry wants the urban market to die. You know, it, they feel like the we cause a problem, but the urban market, you know, is how we portray what's going on in our communities and what's going on around us is, is through music. Music can change your life, can change your mood, changes everything. But as far as like out there, it's, they're on the urban music, but they're starting to go away from it because a lot of the big name urban artists have gotten smart and started doing crossover tracks or doing dance tracks or collabing with artists that are in a different genre, which a lot of the urban artists that are starting out or not high in the game 
are scared to do or don't want to do because they feel like that it's going to, I guess you would say, some people say give them a bad name where they feel like they're not from the streets anymore or this and that. But the thing is, is you got to have the passion to do this for one. But not only have the passion, you got to have the ability to adapt and, and want to grow your craft. Because if you're able to make urban music and able to transfer over and do top 40 or dance, but still have your urban music. I mean, take example, look at Flow Rider. His first two singles were, were rap singles. He did a, a pop track and it took off. And look where he's at now. You know, he's doing a lot of top 40 dance pop records. He's just now starting to do some of the urban stuff, but he's made so much money in the crossover market. You know, he pushed a little bit of urban to the side, which maybe he did a little too much, but at the same time, it's either you're going to make money and love what you do and, and perform. Cause the thing is you got to love to perform. You know, it's not just, I want to get on stage and rap, you know? So you just, it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of people don't understand how much work it is. I think people blow up overnight just cause they see a new artist come out. Like this artist just blew up and, you and I both know there's artists that we've worked with for five, six years and they finally get a break. You know, it usually takes, they say the rule is seven to 10 years before you even get your, your chance, you know? So I hope it doesn't die because I love urban music, but at, at the moment it's, you know, being, you know, traveling around the world and hearing what they listen to. There's not much of the urban music that they still ask for. You know, it's the urban music is starting to become underground, you know? Why is the urban music dying? And when we are the people who it's, it's made for, why aren't black people, you know, not just black people, but urban fans, how come the music isn't thriving because of those particular fans? Because we don't want to pay for nothing. Because we want everything for free. And, you know, we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. And nobody supports anybody no more. There's no unity you know, where you look at Latin music, the Latin culture, the pop music, it all circulates within their culture three or four times before it goes out. You know, they don't, a lot of the pop culture starting to do crossover tracks with, with some of the urban artists. They don't have to because they're, they're doing their own thing. But the problem is we don't support each other. We don't go buy albums. Uh, we see if we can download it free or or nobody wants to support anybody that's in the hood trying to sell their music. There's a lot of people that are selling good music, not saying it's all good and we should buy everything. But in a way, we need to find a way to support, even if it's just giving somebody a dollar here and there, you know, because them couple of dollars could add up to that person being able to buy real studio time and, and, and build something. And if everybody gets together, the urban market is a very strong market because the urban market has the biggest collective of DJs and producers. If the urban market was to bear together, it would take over the industry. You know, the urban market would be number one. But right now, the industry is able to, you know, I want to say rip off the urban market because they use us. You know, they give us, you know, deals that ain't no good, you know, 360 deals that nobody's making any money but the, the label and things like that. And some artists are so stupid and happy to to sign a deal, they do that. Some of them don't even own their own music. You know, they're not BMI or CSAC or ASCAP members. You know, they're out here and they don't own their music. Somebody else owns their music, so they never get paid. So it doesn't generate into 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 our our term of economy of you know as far as the lower class because we're considered the lower class. You know, so it's nobody works together and everybody wants everything for free. You know, even. Like I said, even the DJs are guilty. I'm guilty. Everybody's guilty of it. You know, it just it has to stop, has to change in order for the urban to come back alive again because there's a lot of good music. All right. Now, we've been around quite a few different places. We've done a lot of traveling together. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been in all kinds of cities. And, you know, we've been to countless, you know, music conferences. Mm -hmm. And one thing that the DJs are always talking about is the fact that DJs aren't breaking records. So aside from artists or fans, rather, buying music, you know, why aren't the DJs doing more to dictate what's being played versus what the fans are requesting that's being pushed by mainstream media? Because they're scared. The DJs, a lot of DJs, they won't admit it. They're scared that somebody's going to take their spot. Because with the new age of technology, there's so many different DJs in a lot of the industry has put it in DJ's head that, well, if you don't do it, we'll get somebody else to do it. 
So basically, a lot of DJs are scared, so they follow what the radio does. And there's there's a few of us out there that, that don't. Now, as far as me, there's a few things that, you know, radio hits, you got to play. I mean, hands down, some of them are good. But if you don't stick your neck out, it's not going to change. It's going to follow the cycle of the radio. Or even XM is starting to get really commercialized like the radio was. Where before you go to XM and hear a lot of music, on the way here today, I'm driving, I'm hearing something, they're saying it's new music and it's something that I know DJs have had for five to six months, which is just like, you know, the terrestrial radio. You know, they'll get on there and yell, it's brand new and everybody thinks it's brand new. And that's part of the problem because I remember breaking records back in the day. As a DJ, we had to work our asses off. You know, it was 50 of us in a crew and we were getting records from the labels. We were doing record pool meeting, meeting with artists, you know, getting drops from them, working these records, taking chances. DJs don't take chances no more. They're scared that it's going to scare off the crowd, but you have to take that chance. You know, if you feel, if you can sit there and say, I would listen to this and it sounds like a club, I mean, you got to try it, you know? And a lot of it is to a lot of the DJs aren't networking like they used to. Because how it used to work is another DJ would say, hey, this is a hot track. So in a DJ's mind, we're thinking he took a chance on his crowd. So I'll take a chance on mine if he took a chance on his and they like it. You know, to go on to, to break the record. It's it's been so commercialized and they didn't got scared, you know, to where they um uh, they don't want to break records. They're scared to step out and it's more it's there's less and there's less coalitions now. There's more DJ crews than coalitions, and there's a difference between a coalition and a crew. Coalitions break records, you know what I'm saying? DJ crews, they just kind of hang together and, and do different gigs and everything. So but you know, it's, I just think the fact that they're scared, you know, it's, they're scared of what somebody's going to say, or they're probably scared that somebody's going to take their spot, you know, because it, because right now it's hard for a DJ to get a good residency and stay, stay within it because there's so many DJs trying to get in. What's going to have to happen, you know, to combat the whole situation in reference to the industry? Because like now a lot of artists are starting to go independent. You know, there's more technology out here. There's more um, more resources than there were before. Like, what has to happen to turn things around? I mean, there's not there's nothing wrong with everybody going independent and doing their own thing. That's really in life. That's the goal is to be able to survive on your own and do your own thing. You know, you shouldn't have to depend on nobody. So it's good. It's in a way, it's good. In a way, it's bad. Um, but it's good that everybody goes. That everybody is going independent because right now. The labels are not giving any type of deals that are going to make another person financially stable. A lot of your urban market, you know, comes from the gutter. You know what I'm saying? They come from the bottom, you know? So it's like the labels know that and them not giving them a deal that is substantial allows them to be able to control them. So going independent really is the best way, but going independent is also the hardest way. Because the labels have that machine, you know, they put the machine behind you and make things happen. So that's the advantage of that. But what's going to have to happen is everybody's going to have to swallow their pride and stand together and unify in some, some sort of way in order for it to work. And it has to work with everybody, DJs, producers, um, artists, rappers, singers, whatever in the music industry, promoters, everybody. Because everybody's so quick to try to get a dollar. I hate to say it, but it's messing up the game because everybody's shortcut people. Then you got people, there's a lot of snakes in this game. So which makes people scared to trust other people. You know, that's why they go independent. That's why they do their own thing, you know, but it's, you're going to have to build that trust factor back up within the urban market and then build the unity back up, you know, and the DJs are going to have to swallow their pride a little bit and stop trying to charge every artist for to play a song. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm the type, if I hear a song and I think it'll go, I'll tell you. If I don't like it, I'm going to tell you, but I may say, just because I don't like it don't mean it ain't good. I, there's been songs that I've heard, I'm like, I don't like it, but it's going to go. You know what I'm saying? Or there might be something that doesn't work in my market, but I know what'll work in another DJ's market. So I might say, hey, contact such and such. This might not work out here right now, but grow your buzz with, with this person. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people think DJs don't talk. And we talk, even DJs that don't really care for each other, you know, so it's, it's bad to burn your bridges with a DJ, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of the DJs 
have become producers. And the reason a lot of things people have noticed is DJs have became artists and have took taken over the, the industry. And there's some artists that are upset about that because what's happened is it clicked in our heads. It's like, okay, we're pushing this artist. We're promoting this artist. And then this artist goes and does something stupid or doesn't do what they're supposed to do. It messes up my money or messes up my situation. So therefore, we started thinking if we promote ourselves like an artist, put artists on tracks, because a lot of us DJs own music. We have BMI, ASCAP. We have, you know, um, publishing companies and we sign artists. That's how a lot of DJs make their money. You know, it's the game has gotten so wide. You know, it's DJs are promoting themselves like artists. And I don't want to say it's going to have to stop. But it's going to have to be everybody come back together. A lot of it was DJs got upset and got tired of getting the short in the stick. We always get the short in the stick. You know, promoters always don't want to pay us, this, that, and the other. You know what I'm saying? So DJs started promoting themselves like artists. Now, if you look around, DJs are the big name artists. You know, DJ Khaled. You got uh, DJ Premier doing things. A couple other DJs out on the West Coast. DJ Mustard. You know what I'm saying? A lot of these cats are either producers or have a tight circle where they have producers and they're putting artists together and putting them on tracks even drama's doing you know so it's it's you're gonna have to put in the footwork you know that's what it's gonna have to be and everybody's gonna have to band together and have some unity so we uh you know when you grew up in the 80s and 90s so you were around you know in hip-hop's heyday Mm -hmm. you know you saw the different changes it went through Mm -hmm. um you know, our era growing up, we actually went back and checked out a lot of the old stuff. You know, our parents put us on it. Mm-hmm. You know, we were around during those times. And everybody knows, well, I ain't going to say everybody knows, but the real music head knows, or hip-hop heads, they know that the DJ started out as the main guy. Yeah. And then you had the MC. So yeah. you also had pairs of an MC and a rapper that basically rocked the crowd together. Yeah. Now, in your situation, like, you see a lot of DJs um, over, you know, early 90s, 80s and things of that nature that they had a DJ like DJ, you know, Jazz Jeff or Fresh Prince, you know, mm-hmm. duos like that. Um, <coughs> Premier, you know, uh, DJ Premier has a lot of artists that he works with. You know, um, are you working with any artists or have you worked with any artists? And what was the experience like? Um, I've worked with a few um, and it was a great experience. Um, until the artist did something that messed it up for all of us. That was the downfall. You know, working with working with artists, they have to be on the same page as you. You have to be on the same page. You have to click. Everything has to be, you know, boom, boom, boom. Because if not, it's not going to work. You know, because now you're putting your career in somebody else's hands in a way. Because now you've not only become just a DJ. In a way, you've become a group. Just like Run DMC. You know, Run DMC was two MCs and a DJ, basically. You know what I'm saying? So, and look what happened, you know, rest in peace, Jam Master J, but look what happened when he he left. You know, Run DMC, I wouldn't say they died, but they quit doing music. That was the one piece of the element they were missing because they did things together so well, and Jam Master J was their backbone. You know what I'm saying? Because back in the day, you didn't perform without a DJ. That was how performers perform. Now it's, here's my jump drive, here's my CD, play my track. And there's no, there's nothing live about it. You know, it's the artist on stage trying to perform, which is, some artists can pull it off, but some can't. It's so much better with a live DJ, especially one that you click with and that knows your music and knows, you know, how you are, you know. And I've worked with a lot of different artists. I've been on stage with a lot of different artists. Everybody does it different. But... Now, even now, with the way things are in technology, when people see an artist come out and they come out with the DJ and it's live, it brings a whole nother aspect and they get a lot more respect for that because it's that's how it started. You know what I'm saying? That's how it was. The DJs would make the beats, you know, beat, juggle and do different things and everybody would rap over. You know what I'm saying? That's how it started. A lot of people don't they miss that part of the culture. You know, they they go straight to I want to be on the radio. You know, it's. It's a never-ending battle. Okay. And, you know, the artists, you know, we've we've come across countless artists over and over and over again. And 
it, you would think that, okay, five years ago, there were a lot of artists that we don't even see anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the lifespan of an artist or uh, an aspiring artist is real short. Yeah. You know, what are some of the mistakes that you see that they make early on? And what do you think that they need to do to do a better job and to get further along? Well, first of all, the number one thing artists do to mess up is give up. It takes drive and determination. There's some people that have drive. There's some people that have determination. Some people don't have them both. Some people got one or the other. People think it's going to happen overnight. It doesn't. You know what I'm saying? I started, when I started DJing, you know, honestly, that was, what, 15 years ago or so. Maybe a little longer. And I'm just now really starting to get, you know, build my steam. You know, it took me, it took me 10 years before I seen any real results. You know, I was still working a regular job working 50 hours a week, 50 plus hours a week, plus DJing on the weekends or wherever I can get a gig. Now, this is what I do, you know, and it took me, you know, seven to 10 years to to get that as a DJ, even working with artists and and breaking records. You know, had I known now, you know, known then what I know now, you know, I'd be paid too, you know, but it, it was all about, you know, who you could work with and this, that and the other. And it's, you know, first of all, it's going to take a lot of hard work. You're going to have sacrifices. Um, you're going to find out who your real family and real friends are real fast. You know what I'm saying? Because you got to sacrifice a lot in this industry. But the number one thing is artists don't want to work with other artists. They don't learn about split sheets and percentages and BMI and ASCAP. They see stuff on TV and they think, okay, well, we can we can do this and we can, you know, because there's a lot of artists out here that are better than some of the people that are mainstream. And that's real. But, if you don't got your paperwork in line, one, you're not going to survive because you're not going to last. You know, it's, it's if you get a single and it takes off and you don't own it, that's it. I mean, I experienced that myself. As much as I've talked to artists and done things, I bought a beat from a producer before I could um, before I could get all the paperwork straight. I put three artists on the track. I've redone the track four times. And to this day. I still don't fully own the track because the producer never signed the rest of the paperwork. So I can't legally push it because of that. You know what I'm saying? So it's, you got to get your paperwork in line. That's, that's what it is now. It's, it's all about paperwork and have your business in line, but it's also your networking, your net, your net worth is your net, your network is your net worth. It's, I mean, hands down, it's all about who, you know, you know, it's unfortunately, it's not even a talent game anymore. You know, it's about who, you know, and how hard you work. You know, I've seen people, they have better talent, but you have another artist who's working 10 times harder. They're going to get that attention. So and with all the social media and everything, you got to just grind. You got to keep pushing. Even when you think it's not there, you know, talk to the DJs, meet with the DJs, meet with people and take the criticism because some people just don't got it. It's simple as that. They want to be there, but they don't got it. But that doesn't mean you can't be in the industry. You know, there's a lot of people I've seen people that realize, OK, I'm not a good rapper but I'm good at making beats. So they've switched over to that. A lot of, a lot of the, the rappers that are on right now started out as producers or ghostwriting. A lot of people don't know that. They think, oh, well, they just got on. No, they use another tool to get in where they want. You know, you, you got to use your tools and use your network. A lot of artists give up too easy because they think it's going to happen overnight. You know, it's, you're going to go through some sacrifice. You're going to have some hard nights. You're going to have some nights when you're crying. I mean, it's, it's real. It, it, it gets real, you know what I'm saying? And you put so much into it. You know, when you, there's a lot of artists you can ask, how much did you invest in yourself? And some of the numbers an artist can give you will blow your mind away. You know, I've invested probably over 40 or 50,000 in myself, and I'm just now starting to get results. And I'm a DJ, you know. So what are some of the uh, the obstacles that you've had to go through personally? Like, some of the, like what's the wildest thing that's happened to you? Just, I ain't gonna say the wildest thing, but what tell us a story about something that happened in your career that was crazy you know in reference to trying to make it just the stuff you had to go through to get where you're trying to go i mean the biggest thing that anybody's going to go through especially a dj is doing free stuff doing free mixtapes doing free shows doing you know because you got to find a way to showcase yourself i mean i used to open up for um for dj lp every party he did I never asked to get paid, you know, every now and again, he'd throw me some money, but it wasn't a big deal because I seen the bigger picture of it. So I did a lot of free parties, a lot of late nights, 
a lot of cheap parties at first, you know what I'm saying? Because I wanted to make the big money. So, you know, as far as that, just you got to get out there. You know, a lot of artists will pay pay a promoter to, to perform on a show. And that's the wrong thing to do because nobody gives a shit that you're on that stage. They want you off the stage so they can see the artists they came to see. You know, you paying to get on the stage is not going to get you anywhere. It's just... You can say, well, I opened up for such as you didn't really open up for them. You paid to open up for them. It's a difference than saying they, they call you say, hey, we need you to open up for this artist. You're going to get X amount of dollars where you saying, OK, this promoter, I give him fifteen hundred and I can perform. Like, no, nah, that's not that's not how it works. You know what I'm saying? But it's I've seen some things, you know, it's just as far as me, it's just a lot of free stuff, a lot of struggle, um, a lot of handing out mixtapes, selling mixtapes out the car. Um, you know, trying to put them in stores and people telling you, no, you know, you won't ever do this. You won't be good. This, that, and the other, man. It's just basically a lot of free stuff. I mean, I remember driving to other cities, you know, to DJ for free or to DJ for a low amount to get my foot in the door. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's probably, you know, that's the wildest thing I've done shows and everything, but it's just, I mean, it gets wild, you know, I mean, things happen. You know, fights break out. You might be at a good gig and get something going and a fight break out. And next thing you know, that's it. You know. All right. So you moved to a, <laughs> moved to Arizona. We talked about that a little earlier. You know, and, um, you know now, you know, you're doing big things. Uh, tell us a little bit about the new endeavors and how they're going. Out. Well, I uh, <clears throat> recently... Um, I got into an adventure. Um, basically, how it all started was I started my own clothing line and T-shirt company. But how it all started was I was looking for endorsements. Um, I'm online, Googling, YouTube, and trying to find a way. How can I get endorsements? How can I get somebody to pay me to wear their clothes or pay me to do this or pay me to support their equipment? Couldn't get any responses, you know, pound of the pavement. And I started thinking, why don't I do my own thing? So I designed... I designed, you know, my, my DJ life. You know, this is currently my design and, and my clothing line. Um, I designed it. I, it was something I didn't really plan on putting out. I just designed it and kind of messed around with it. And um, uh, I was dating someone and she told me to take a chance on it. And at first I thought, you know, no, nah, it's not going to go nowhere. So I took a chance on it. I took her advice. I took a chance on it. And I remember I pressed up. See, I did, I think, three shirts and a hoodie. And I did three shirts and a hoodie and I started wearing them around the city. Now, when I first, when I first did, I was I, honestly, I was really nervous because I was like, man, these people are going to reject it because you get so used to failing and rejection, it becomes normal. So I'm thinking that's going to happen. And the next thing I know, everybody starts asking me, how can I get one of the shirts? How can I get a shirt? How can I get a shirt? So I was like, well, you know, I told one person, I remember this conversation. I was like, well, this is for DJs because I designed it for DJs, you know, because I felt like we didn't have a platform that was for us. Artists had clothing and, and this and that. So I felt like the DJs needed a platform. And what better way to bring it from a DJ? So somebody come up to me and asked me about buying a shirt. Instead of thinking business wise, I, I thought, well, this is for DJs. You're not a DJ. You know, why would you want this? And their response to me was, well, wouldn't you want everybody wearing your design? And dollar signs went off in my head. I said, well, yeah, you know, it's not a bad idea. So I started to progressively sell them and started off. Um, I got a small little investment from a friend of mine that believed in what I was doing. And uh, the next thing I know, I'm selling shirts nonstop and hoodies and uh, getting ready to release a few other things and different designs and and now it's it's grown in Arizona to where I have DJs on other uh, on cruise ships wearing them, you know I got DJs in other cities wearing them. I've DJ all all around my city wearing them, which also progressed into me starting my own T-shirt company where I do custom designs and do everything for like a lot of the businesses around the area that I'm in, and it's been very successful. And I've not released it on a full full on scale yet, which is my next step. Um, it was kind of a test run, and so it's. You know, it, it became more than just being a DJ. You know, you had to become a businessman, an entrepreneur in order to survive in this game. Because how I thought about how could I set myself apart? You know, everywhere you see me, you see DJ life on me. You know, DJ life wristbands and, you know, DJ life stickers and just 
everything I can put it on. I do, I do the promotion with the flyers on it. You know, I, I, I started sponsoring events and it's grown. I don't, you know, it's, it's a great experience. All right. You mentioned uh, having people on cruise ships wearing your gear, you know, mm -hmm. um, what's your connection with the cruise ships? Uh, currently I work for the cruise lines. Uh, I'm currently a DJ on, on the, on the cruise ships and uh, traveling the world, you know, DJing all over the place on the cruise ship and, that's that's been an experience all on its own i mean and they've seen it and you know so they've asked me to create a few other designs i got a few other designs i'm releasing for the the people that work on ships and, and understand the ship life and things like that but that just it just grew into that i had the connection with them and they started wearing them on other ships and it's been a great deal but now i'm also a dj on a cruise ship so that's you know, me traveling the world and, and seeing different places and being able to promote my brand and my gear in other countries is, is an amazing experience. So where have you been so far on cruise ship? And for how, how long were you on? Um, usually on about six months at a time on my current contracts that I'm on. Um, I just came back from, uh, we did, let's see, we did some of the Caribbean, like St. Thomas, St. Croix, uh, St. Crits, uh, Dominica, St. Lucia, uh, Puerto Rico. There's a bunch of places we went in the Caribbean. We were in a different country every day. I woke up in a different country every day. Um, then we switched and we, uh, we changed ports and we went up. We were porting out of uh, New Jersey after that. And we were going to Bermuda. I went to Bermuda for about four months you know, got to know the culture there and the people there and promote a little bit of my brand there. And then the last little run we did, it was up through uh, the East Coast in Canada and Quebec. And and so, so far, that's where I've been so far. I'm heading out here real soon on, on the next adventure. So a few other places to add to the list. So where are you, you going to be going next? Uh, next, we're doing, doing all of Australia, all of New Zealand, um, Fiji, Bora Bora, Tahiti, um, the, I think it's called the South Island Pines, which is out by Tahiti and Bora Bora. Uh, also Hawaii, Alaska, Canada. So we, I'll be for the next six months, I'll be in, in those places back and forth. I won't be in the U S for another six months. So it's going to be a little different. Being somebody who didn't really do a whole lot of traveling, you know, or being abroad, you know, early on in life, you know, what has that taught you in reference to seeing that? The world is much bigger than, than Indianapolis or even going down to Atlanta or Miami or wherever else. It's, it's crazy because, um, I mean, you and I have both been on the road together and we've been probably every city in the Midwest. You know, we've promoted everywhere. Um, I've been all over the U.S. And to go outside of the U.S. and see the different cultures of how they live and how things operate is, is amazing. It's an experience that I can't even describe in words. I mean, it's... If there's more than just Atlanta. People want to run to Atlanta. There's more. There's so much more out there. I mean, the culture and the different countries, the different types of food, uh, the women, you know, just everything. I mean, and learning how their culture is, their country is opposed to how ours is and how we operate. It's, it's culture shock and it, it makes you look at life and world, the world, a completely different place. Now, what, how do you feel about the just, you know, when you're talking about culture, you're talking about values, you know, um, what is the reception of how do people in, from other countries and things like that, how do they feel about us and what's been your interaction with them? And have you broken any stereotypes? Have you lived up to any that they may have had? You know, what's the interaction been like with those kinds? Yeah, you, you break a lot of stereotypes um, because in a lot of countries' minds, Americans are lazy. And honestly, we are, you know, but they're under the assumption that we all are. But meeting people all over the world, the culture, it makes you look at America as a country different. I mean, I love I love my country. I'm, you know, I'm American till the day I die, you know, but we got some improvement to do. I mean seeing how appreciative these people are to make the type of money that they're making and doing what they're doing, being away from their families and how they grew up and how things are in their country. It's, it's amazing. We got nothing to complain about, you know, we too busy out here killing each other, you know, and 
it's not about that. A lot of these other countries have a lot of their unity is strong, you know, and they're proud to be from where they're from. They all want to come to America because they see how free we are and how we're able to do what we want. But they love their countries. You know what I'm saying? And it's there's a lot of stereotypes out there. In, and as far as stereotypes, not just stereotypes with Americans, it was stereotypes with how Americans feel about some of these other countries and being around these people. I learned so much. I have friends all over the world. I have friends in, you know, England, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Philippines, China, Japan. We always have those conversations about how things are, how things differentiate. And, you know, we ask a lot of questions and they answer them. We answer them and it's no, they don't hold it against us. You know, when we ask them, they tell us and when they ask us, we tell them and differentiate how things are. It's, it's crazy, man. Um, you know, over the last six months, who's been the most either influential or the, the person who stood out to you the most over the last six months and why? You know, why as far as special, you know, why anything, any uh, female, a male, like just somebody that you met over the last six months that made a real big impression on you and why was that important to you? Um, I mean, there's quite a few people, to be honest with you. I mean, I would say going back farther than six months, but um, as far as in six months, I met a lot of people on the ship that, you know, it be, you become a family. I mean, you all live together for six or six or more months. Some people are on there for eight months, you know, you become a family. So I've gotten family out of this, not only friends, you know what I'm saying? And, and when you run into other Americans on the ships, there's only, on my last ship, there was only, at one point, there was 20 of us out of a thousand crew members. When I got on the ship, I made number 10. So coming on a ship, you're minority, you know? So you kind of stick together, you get family out of it. But as far as like influential, I would have to say, um, there, there's a gentleman named Rob Natigal. Um, He's from Canada. He is the one that's, that's helped me with my, helped me with some of my branding, other than, you know, what I've done as far as with the heat spinners and with 24 seven magazine and, and everybody else that I work with. But as far as, as the branding, I guess you would say I've taken it more to a corporate level. Um, and with that, you know, he, he helped me out by getting me, you know, getting me the contract, you know, giving me an opportunity to get the contract with, you know, with the company that I'm with now. And I'm now able to, you know, travel and do things. He was the one that helped me out, you know, telling me, hey, try this, do this, um, you know, doing my EPK and different things like that. So he all in all was the one to put things in, in a perspective, in a position. And all I had to do was listen. You know what I'm saying? I, and, I, and sometimes I kind of was like, you know, like it's like when you talk to an artist or somebody else that you tell them something, and they're kind of like, I don't know if that's going to work. And I was kind of the same way, but I'm glad all in all that I listened because here I am now being able to travel the world and meet people and be in these different places and being able to DJ, you know, all over the world. So. Oh, now you say you woke up in a different country every day. Which one of those countries did you get to spend enough time on to, to where that made the most, the biggest impression on you? And where would you want to go back and live? Bro? Go back and live? Where it's like, you know what, I'm just... If you had to choose any of those countries that you went to in the last six months, which one would you go and stay at for for a year? Ah, uh, man, Saint Lucia was pretty. I liked Saint Lucia, and I think it was Saint Petersburg, Saint Philip's Peters Petersburg. It's really pretty. I, one of those two. Um, I would. I know. I want to go back to see more of it. Um, I didn't get to see a lot of it like I did Bermuda. Bermuda, I seen inside and out. You know what I'm saying? Um, Bermuda's a beautiful place. I recommend going there at least once. But I've been there for four months straight, so it was kind of like I got, you know, kind of got tired of it. But St. Lucia is definitely very, very pretty. You know, um, I actually had an opportunity while I was in St. Lucia. I took one of the uh, the tours and we went through the rainforest. So going through the rainforest and, and, and seeing these different things and, you know, they had trees in there. If you touch them, it'll kill you like poisonous trees. It's it's wild. You know, it's wild to see these things that you see on Discovery Channel, you know, or on History Channel to be there in some of those areas. Like um, there's an airport that's very dangerous. And I believe it's in um, I believe it's in St. Croix or St. Lucia 
where guests will or people will stay on the beach and get blown over by the airplanes because it lands right there. You know, and I've been there and to see that on TV and to be able to go there, I would probably say St. Lucia because it doesn't get below 70 degrees out there. So if I had to pick one right now, I would say St. Lucia. That might change within the next six months because I'm going a lot of other places, but I'd say St. Lucia. St. Lucia, St. Mm. Lucia. So, um, you know, you you told me a story about uh, a bunch of mangoes. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, tell our people a little bit about that and why why that was so significant. Yeah, uh, we were doing a tour, and the gentleman that was giving us give us giving us a tour, you know, of course he was a St. Lucia native, native, and uh, he was hilarious. He was he was cool. He was down to earth, and uh, he was telling us that. He asked us, do we know how many different types of mangoes there are in St. Lucia? And, you know, we're thinking four or five. What well, are 74 different types of mangoes? And a lot of people can name each different one. But what made the story even funnier is when he was telling us is that they there's ways that they know if you're really from St. Lucia or you move there. And this is how they know if you're a true native. Um, what they, If you cannot climb a tree, you're not from St. Lucia. It's hands down. That's what he said. If you can't climb a tree, you're not from St. Lucia. Because a lot of what happens is they climb up in the tree to get the mangoes or knock the mangoes down. Because when food goes short, that's what they eat is mangoes. So it was kind of wild for him to tell us that. And it was it was true. You know, you see him climbing trees and it's it's wild. You know, it was hilarious. At any moment while you were on these 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 ships or or on these islands did you think about castaway <laughs> we always did <laughs> we would always laugh about you know about that about wilson and all that crazy stuff but it, it's not like everybody thinks it is i mean you know it was a big stereotype with with all the all that stuff but i mean the islands looked like that i mean the islands are beautiful so yeah you you think about you think about some of these movies but in all reality it's all a big hype you know well, the reason I ask is because at one point you told me that, you know, when you first got on the ship, you didn't know anybody, so you would stay on the ship because yeah. you didn't want to get lost or left behind. Yeah. So in, in, a, in, in reality, you would, you know, you may not be on a deserted island, yeah. but you would be left somewhere where, you know, what was the, the language barrier? You know, was uh, were you able to talk to everybody? Well, that, the language barrier, all the places I went, they spoke good English. Um so it wasn't really the language barrier. It was just the fact of getting off and not knowing where nothing's at or how anything operates and getting lost. And then you look up and the ship's leaving, you know, so it was like, <laughs> I didn't want to be left behind. I mean, plus, if you if you miss the ship, you're fired. I mean, so it was, you know, it, you was done, you know, I mean, they don't get me wrong. They don't just leave you, though. Like if you miss the ship, this is how it works. You miss the ship. They leave your passport because we don't carry our passports. The ship keeps our passports for all the custom stuff. So so basically, if the ship's leaving and you're not on the ship, they got a counter, a scanner. We have to scan our IDs when we come in. So they know how many people are on the ship and who's off, who's not, this, that, and the other. So basically, what would happen is if I missed the ship, they would leave my passport there with the port people. They would make sure I had money, food, somewhere nice to stay and make sure I'm good and get me a flight. And get me a flight and get me a flight back to the ship. Now, what's going to happen is they're going to take care of you like you're a king and then get you back to the ship and then they fire you. So they don't leave you. People think, oh, well, you're going to get on a cruise ship and they're going to and, and you and you're they're going to leave you. Now, they, they'll leave a guest, you know what I'm saying, because you, you're on your own, you know, but you're stupid for not getting back to the ship on time. But as far as that, it's, it was a time I almost missed the ship. I, I was running to, towards the ship and almost didn't make it. I, I remember that, you know, so it's. It's scary because you don't want to be left somewhere, you know, especially somewhere you don't know. Future endeavors. What are you What are you looking to do in the in the future or after you're done cruising? You know, what's the next thing for Jake Torch? Uh, the next thing is, um, like I said, you know, like I said, um, I got Creation DJs. I'm, I'm working on building that, you know, building the brand on that, building my brand as myself. Um, working on getting some things going, maybe in Las Vegas, um, L.A., San Diego, some of the. Some of the bigger nightclubs I'd like to get into. Um, but the biggest thing is really I'm biggest my biggest focus is my clothing line and expanding it and and putting it in, you know, to where it can be um a real company, a a name brand in the industry, you know, where all DJs are wearing DJ Life clothing stuff, you know. Um 
But other than that, it's my ultimate goal within the next couple of years is to open up my own, you know, my own nightclub and and build off of that. Because, I mean, I don't want to say I want, I'm going to stop DJing, um, but because I have the love for it. So I'm always going to DJ. But you have to look at the bigger picture, you know what I'm saying, and 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 build your brand and expand expand yourself. And I feel like that's the next step for me is is that. I mean, I'd like to be on satellite radio or something like that, but I feel like the next step is me, you know, doing my own nightclub. So um, you know, how can people get in contact with you for anything? Uh, Twitter, um, really actually anything at J Torture. Um the all my websites or I wouldn't say my websites, but all my uh all my social media is at J Torture, J T O R C H E R. Um Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, um pretty much anything social media I'm there. Um or you can just go straight to www.jtorture.com and that'll you know that'll get you in contact with everything. Also my mixes are on there, video mixes, uh, my blog. A little bit of everything on there, a little bit of something for, something for everybody. Um, but Twitter is probably my, the main point. Twitter and Snapchat, you know, at J Torture, um, I do respond. You know, I do follow back and things like that. So I'm not, I'm not Hollywood. You know, I'm just trying to make it like everybody else. So, and you know, last thing is now that you're you're doing a whole lot of traveling. You know, are you still the Midwest assassin? You know, I'm probably going to have to retire that. You know, I, as much as I hate to say it, you know, and, and people call me that. And the way I got the name was funny, but I haven't lived in the Midwest for three years. I mean, I still do well when it comes to mixtape sales and things like that. But honestly, I've kind of I've kind of retired it a little bit, you know, because it's it's like an era. You know, it was the Midwest assassin was my alter ego. You know, but the crazy thing is letting it go. I don't really have a new alter ego. You know, it's just, I don't know. Like maybe it's something that you grow out of, you know, because I've always claimed to be the R&B mixtape king. You know what I'm saying? And it's, and the reason why is because of the, all, all the R&B mixes. But some things you just grow out and move on and, and you leave alone, you know, but you leave it where it's at, you know. So I, I don't know. That's That's a question I really can't answer at the moment, but I think I'm going to have to let it go, you know.